yeah. All right, let's uh, let's get into what we hate about certain cameras and lenses. They consume you, don't we? Ooh, Paul, let's so, let's have you start well, this off, man. You kind of started a little bit when you were talking about the R five. Uh, you know, so recently, one of the things that a lot of people, especially in the Canon camp, were really annoyed at was the predecessor to the joystick that you have in the R five. What was that? Gosh darn touch bar that I think, Chris, you were one of maybe two people I know personally that actually like that thing. That touch bar was just god awful to use. <laughs> <laughs> As Brett looks away. <laughs> I mean, I you know, like, like we, we all three of us have shot with the R and the RP, and uh, you know, like. To me, that just felt like something that was a feature that nobody asked for. And it just, it was ill conceived and ill implemented. And ultimately, we see that they've replaced it. So, they, you know, I feel a bit of vindication there. Uh, they well, they offered a firmware update that like made it easier for playback that you just use it for that or something like that. Okay. But when I'm actually shooting with it and I want to use it to change features, it's so, why? It's so much easier to just put a dial there and cheaper. I agree. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's like there's innovation and then there's just innovation for innovation's sake. I don't know, man. Every time my thumb hits that thing, I feel like I'm touching the ghost of Steve Jobs personally. I don't oh, know. That, that, that sounds like a very unique Chris Gampad problem. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think it's a problem. I think it's being touched by an angel. I don't know. It's, it's annoying. Just the fact that, you know, so... I basically have any time I shoot with an ESR, I just don't use that touch bar at all. I just disable it. I, you know, I'll customize one of the um, lens rings on the lens to change the setting. And sometimes I forget that I have to do that, and I like, oh, why is my ISO all the way like up? Because mm -hmm. I, I was gripping the lens and I, you know, adjusted the ISO by accident. So that's another quirk that's annoying. Um, and you know, let's start off front, right? Uh, let's talk about let's let's start with lenses first. One of the things that I it, I personally find annoying is when you have a lens that has different rings. Um, like for example, I've got this Fuji in front of me, right? This uh, this is a sixteen to eighty. This lens is great, but there are some lenses where each ring, all the different rings, are shaped roughly the same. And they all turn roughly with the same level of resistance. And for someone like if I, uh, you know, you, you guys shoot a lot of landscapes too. You never, like you want each ring to have a distinct feel to it. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, like you're looking at the back of the camera and you want to just be able to grab the lens, make the adjustment and, you know, not have to worry about it. But when all the rings feel the same, that's a huge issue. And another thing with that is, if you're going to give me a manual focus adjustment ring, don't make it loosey goosey, please. It's that's one of the most annoying things ever because you want to be able to make fine micro adjustments to your focus. That's the whole point of us defaulting over to manual, anyways. Otherwise, just you know, we have we have autofocus that you know for the most part pretty much works great nowadays on every system. But if we do need manual focus, that's because we want to override that and make these minute adjustments to fine tune the focus. So uh, this is especially problematic on lenses that have a drive-by wire focus system, because you know you try to fine tune it and you can't sometimes, and it, it's a pain. Like you know, what do you, what do you guys think? You think it should be like Leica and Zeiss level of smoothness on the focusing ring? Or? It's it's not so much smoothness. It's that. Well, it's, it's both smoothness and resistance. Because sometimes like it could be the smoothest, you know, manual focus ring at all. But if there's not enough resistance, you're making, like, you could over adjust and you could overshoot where you want the manual focus to be. And that that's a that's a pain in the rear. Yeah, uh, I, I don't know if it's something that just, I'm just super nitpicky or like, what, what do you guys think? Like, Brad or <coughs> like, do you Brett, guys go ahead, man. Brett? I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. No, I was saying, uh, go ahead and weigh in on this. 
on the uh, manual focusing. Yeah. yeah, like just when you have like a loosey goosey like manual adjustment. Right? Oh yeah, I mean you got to be able to have it so that yeah, like I say, for micro adjustments, if it's just too loose, you're just gonna you just skip, buzz, especially for astrophotography. This is a oh. huge pet peeve of mine. Like this is the uh, the Canon, the fifteen to thirty five f two point eight. The manual focus ring on this is incredibly loose, mm -hmm. and when you when you're trying to focus on a pinpoint star in the sky. And you just keep on skipping past it every time. It's it's super annoying. Absolutely. Yeah, that's the worst. It's like right when you're trying to like you hit you hit uh, infinity and you you want to bring it back to hyperfocal. That's usually when I find the most annoying. Like when these lenses that have super loosey goosey manual focus rings, that's when it drives me up the wall. Because like you either at infinity or you just before hyperfocal. I'm like mm -hmm. and you just want to. Mm, yeah, I hate that. Yeah, because yep. it, it's like it, it, anytime you're dealing with that, usually that that's one of the areas where autofocus would, you know, sometimes let you down, especially in low light. So, you know, you want to be able to make these adjustments and you can't because the lens just doesn't allow you to do that. You know, so it's super frustrating. Um, another thing with lenses is not being able to make them like clicked or declicked. Some lenses just they are what they are for sure you know it's fine sometimes but it's another thing right like if you're you, if you are doing fully manual shooting you want to make sure there's as little amount of shake introduced as possible so declicking it actually is sometimes helpful you know this traditionally people associate like declicking a lens with video sure but there, there are applications for photography as well so, I was going to say, I wonder, I wonder if with more cameras becoming more geared towards hybrid shooters, if we're going to start seeing that become more of a, a feature on lenses going forward, that all lenses can become declickable. Well, I hope so. Because which, yeah, but for the most part, I actually do like the clicks because no, I can no, tell. I do like the clicks normally, yeah, but it, there are certain scenarios where I would like to be able to turn them off. Um, and, you know, we've seen manufacturers offer services where you can send the lens in and then what, like 100 bucks, about 50 or something? They basically take the lens apart, remove that ratchet so that you could turn it. And so, you know, if you, if you want to void the warranty and do it yourself and save, save, save 150 bucks, you can. But I think at this point, every lens, if there's room, obviously, on the lens barrel itself, just put a switch on there, let us be able to do that. It, it, you know, charge me an extra five bucks, 10 bucks. So be it, you know? Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I think uh, with what you're saying about lenses, I really, like, as we were saying before, I really think every lens should be weather sealed these days because mm -hmm. yeah. you at go least ahead. The lens mount. At least on the mount. Yeah, I mean, yep. no, no, more than that. I think it should be the mount. I think it should be the body. And you can leave the front element. Let me put a UV filter on there. But I think that all of them should be weather sealed at this point because your phone... I know it's a completely different type of camera, but you can take it out. And I mean, we were talking about this the other day. You can bring it under water and it will be fine. If it's a new modern phone, you can accidentally spill some beer on it and it will be fine. But lenses, that's not always the case. I feel like every lens should be weather sealed at this point. Like it's 2020. You can find a way to do it. You know, yeah. like photography is becoming more and more of a niche hobby anyway like jack the prices up a bit or like you know i, I don't even think they have to necessarily jack the prices up because oh, look cool. at tamron As i was gonna say the new primes from tamron they're 300 bucks they're fully weather sealed i mean yeah. it, it can be it can be done um it's just you know the likes of canon and nikon and whoever yeah. are trying to create that product yeah. segregation right you can have that's the only reason they're doing it but yeah, at the very least, give us some form of it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you know, just I, I feel like we've talked a lot about lenses, but um, just another thing. Apparently, it's a new thing now to not include lens hoods. <laughs> like, <laughs> what the heck, guys? It's less than a it's less than a dollar worth of plastic. Right. There's and you know what? You know, and those lens hoods are probably going to cost you twenty, thirty bucks. You guys. Know? Guys, you're missing the bigger point. They're trying to save the environment. They want you to use less plastic. <laughs> <laughs> okay, give me a give me a metal lens hood like I have on my Leica lenses. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How about yeah. that? <laughs> I'd be you, know, okay. uh, you know what? 
buy a lens would save a lens. That you know, you never know. You bang your lens against like yep. something like you know, bang against a wall or like a railing or something. I'd rather break a lens hood than than break a lens itself. Definitely, absolutely. Yeah. You know, yeah. one other thing with lenses as well is uh, I can't remember a specific lens right now off the top of my head. I know I've used one. It may have been the Nikon 16 to 50. Lenses with no control switches on them at all Ooh. to switch between manual and autofocus that force yeah. you to go through the menus. Like yeah, most, sorry, I, agree. About. I totally agree. Yeah, give me a switch to just toggle between manual and yeah. Or give me the focusing ring that pulls back and forth for you to oh, go. Watch, yeah, all that. Yep. Although some people, if they're not used to it, they'll be like, wait, what happened? Like, why is my lens not working? Like, well, I mean, still that do that with my Oli gear. Yeah. <laughs> I still do that with my Oli gear, man. It's like, oh, man, my lens is well, I'll like, do that. I'll do that sometimes because I use my 90 a lot, uh, the Sony 90 uh, F28 macro. I use that a lot for my product photography. And sometimes, like, why is AF not working? And I mm-hmm. check. I'm like, Am I, is my, you know, focusing zone, like, set incorrectly? Oh, wait, no, the, the AF clutch is engaged. Whoops. So this is reminding me of an email that I answered a long time ago that I still, like, it still sticks out in my head, and it still, like, makes me chuckle sometimes. And it has to do with the larger picture of manufacturers actually working together. They really have to at this point. So uh, the email a while ago... Uh, someone bought a Rokinon lens because they were reading our review and they're like, oh yeah, this seems pretty great. I'll put it on my camera. So they put it on their camera and they're like, hey, I don't understand. Like, why isn't it able to read any of the uh, info as far as like exposure and all that stuff? And I was like, take the camera off auto. And they finally did. And they were finally able to see, oh, it actually can read everything. But because it was an auto mode and because there isn't all that support, it can't really communicate with the camera. Um, it was a rebel, I think. It, it was a problem. Um, so these manufacturers really have to work closer together. Uh, I, I'm finding that with autofocus issues sometimes, like uh, between Sigma and Tamron, Tamron lenses have always felt are a little bit faster than Sigma lenses, and I think part of that might be because uh, Sony owns a portion of Tamron, but like Tamron is certified through Sony, but their lenses are still not as fast as Sony's and Tamron's. So I'm always just like, what's going on there, man? You guys got to work together a little bit more. Uh, in the defense, though, the 35 has been great. No, the 35 one two, uh, it's been it's been really good. I think it's a little slow. Uh, not as much as having, so speaking as someone that used to shoot with the 35-1-4 Zeiss, I think it's comparable, if not slightly faster. Yeah, but I mean, there's also the whole point that it's as large as your head, and I don't want something as large as your head. On oh, I agree. Off. I mean, it depends, right? If you don't need or, you know, care for something that that bright and you can get away with something smaller hey Kev, hey this is the 35 one two it's on the camera right now guys. sir that's actually the uh 58 knocked oh yeah yeah it's it's a special <laughs> bifocal version oh my goodness that's but, awesome. uh yeah i, I think we, we've harped on lenses enough that we should probably jump over to cameras touch screens uh, Give me touch yes. screens. Yes. Touch okay. screen we're, menus. We're, start, we're starting to see people are st- like manufacturers are finally starting to address this. Uh, recently, we've seen Sony finally change and implemented a fully articulating touch screen. And they've also re engineered the menus. Um, I was never one of the people that had a huge issue with Sony menus. Uh, for me, honestly, sometimes when I pick up a Fuji camera, uh, or like an Olympus camera, it takes me a second just to readjust. But that's that's the thing. If you're not accustomed to a system, or you haven't shot with it in a while, these things will come back. Like you know, it will take a bit for you to kind of readjust. But the fact that you know you could actually interact with everything with touchscreen, hallelujah, right? And I think this needs to be done across the board in the industry. Mm-hmm. You know, Fuji you film, a, get on it, please. If you have a touch screen, take full advantage of the entire screen, please. Mm-hmm. You know, 
Also, I think screens should be like at least three point two inches large now. Uh, I'm trying. To I, you know, one I would agree with that though. Or bigger. The the screen on the Fujifilm XT two hundred was three and a half inches, and it was mind blowing in just how amazing that camera was to use with that touchscreen. Yeah, I absolutely loved it. Yeah, and honestly, I mean, I would love it if people would just slice it. I. You guys have heard me talk about this before. If every camera manufacturer just licensed the touchscreens interface from Hasselblad. Like, oh, gosh, <laughs> yes. Like, if you get, like, forget about the cost of entry and, all you know, all the other stuff. But if you shot with a recent Hasselblad camera, oh, that touchscreen interface, it's so good. It's beautiful. It's the, I, 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 I will... I will go out on a limb and say that it is the truly intuitive touchscreen interface on the camera today. Any other camera, well, you're going to like take some time to get, you know, just get the lay of the land. You pick up a Hasselblad and you just, you don't, even if like, you know, you don't need to know where all the buttons are. Look at the back of the screen and you just know what everything is. It's exactly it's that intuitive. You know, that's the thing. If if you have to ex explain a user interface to someone, it's a bad user interface. Yep. It just is. So mm -hmm. the way Hasselblad absolutely nailed that on the X one D two is phenomenal. They took the uh, they took the Apple approach where like you know, like you look at kids, right? You hand them an iPad, they know what to do with it. Because mm -hmm. you're just touching stuff. That's mm -hmm. how the Hasselblad touch screen interface works. So Do you, you know, think I that that means I'm sorry to cut you off, that we probably need more symbols that are more intuitive because like the running man for example makes no sense for sports mode um and the box with the wrench doesn't necessarily mean the same thing to everyone right uh, possibly uh, and we've seen manufacturers try this right like going back to sony for a second Remember when they had all the, that ribbon menu thing where you actually had pictures that accompanied every every menu? This was like way back. Uh, yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, that's before we got the, like the menu that everyone like hates. Um, but we've seen that. And again, yeah, it, it's, I think you need a combination of symbols and, you know, actual word like descriptions or just standardize it across the whole industry. We've seen consortiums pop up in the industry before. And this is something that ultimately just benefits every company. Why not just standardize on the same symbols across the board? We see this in the computer industry, like the power button is the power button, like the power symbol is the power symbol on every device. So like, why not do that? But you know, that would actually require that every company sit down and agree on something so we're thinking too logically here um and then another thing is not having not having enough buttons and dials on either the top or the back of your camera uh and this is it's less of an issue now but on smaller bodies you know how i mean you guys tell me like how annoying is it when you're like you have to jump into the menu to change like your ISO. <laughs> I want to throw the camera across the room. Right. Please. Like th anything that's part of the exposure triangle should have a dedicated dial. I feel. Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. Like take away anything else, but give me a dedicated dial for ISO, for aperture, for shutter speed. Mm, keep playback menu. Uh... Well, I mean, you're going to need a playback button for sure, but I think those like there should all you should never take away those three. Yeah, that's fair. It, it makes no sense um, unless you take know, maybe like Fuji, where a lot of them they just built the aperture ring into the lens. Okay, fine, but then you need to do that across the board, where every lens has it, and not every lens has it. Uh, not every Fuji lens has an aperture ring, and only the lens that has the R designator does. So, yeah, it's just more consistency across the board because sometimes they, they just, oh, this camera has, has, you know, has all three dials. The next camera doesn't. 
But here's a cookie. You could adjust it to whatever you want. But by default, it's not set to that. So it's so people spend like, how do I adjust my shutter speed? Like I can't do it. Like what's wrong? And it, it drives people off the wall, right? And you know, like you, you guys can attest to this. It's the first thing we do when we get a camera. We spend half an hour just trying to like set everything up so like we can actually make all these changes. Yep. And mm-hmm. um, yeah, and dual cart slots. We're at the point where, you know, we're start like a lot of people, oh, you don't need two cards. And then, and out of, and you know, like down the line, the next model revision. Oh, by the way, we have two cards now. So you're at mid. <laughs> so all that whole spiel where you don't need it. Oh, well, then why'd you put it in anyways? Right. So I think we have too many card formats too. Agreed. Yes. I absolutely agree. We're, we're going back to the day where we had SD. Well, SD obviously won. But the SD mm-hmm. memory had, stick duo. We had yeah. Uh, X. There was the the mic. There was like the XD standard, whatever that was. There, I I just yeah. Hang, I have a cart reader here. I'm just gonna like read off of here. Yeah, yeah. but um, yeah. before you do that, our standards right now are uh, CF Express A, CF Express XQD, which are not the same things. They are not. And SD. Go right. ahead. Yeah, so it's we had there's so many different formats, and it's it's again it's the whole pissing contest of who owns what format, right? The whole thing is Sony owns XQD, so that's why a lot of people they used it in the beginning, and then uh, since it's the same form factor, but different um, proprietary of technologies, they're switching over to CFA, right? Mm-hmm. I'm like fine, but just stick to one of them. But now we've got. Oh, it's it's the same size, but it's faster. I'm like, come on, Sony, really? Like, do we really need the compact like compact flash express type A? Because it just like memory stick anyone? Like, you know, it, it just feels like that. Because it's the same size, the the port's the same, but then you put different cords, it's faster. I'm like, okay. Look, it's not like we haven't seen advancements in the SD card slide. Because you have, you can have SD cards up to like one or two terabytes now. Uh, so it's just, yeah, that that's an, uh, another annoyance. And most people, they don't even have the cart readers yet. Everything across the board, if you're lucky enough to have a cart reader on your on your laptop or your computer, it's probably just an SD or a micro SD. So that means you're going to have to get a dongle even for your desktop. So <laughs> have fun with that. Do you think we're going to be reaching the point, and I remember you talk about this, this ICX1, just for instance. They've done away, or will be doing away possibly, with, with SD cards completely and having internal storage. Mm-hmm. Is that something you think we'll, we'll go towards in the well, future? We, we've seen that on the motion side, right? You know, we see like the Reds and the Aries. They literally, their memory cards is a, it's basically a solid state drive and a custom uh, manufactured enclosure so you have to pay them to buy their SSDs mm. otherwise you know it's not going to slot into the camera uh, I don't see that happening on the still side just because where are you going to fit the thing you know you well, have I mean, to you, make, you, have you to can make use an removable. NVMe pretty easy I mean right, it's, it's, it sticks a timing you have to make it removable that's the thing because uh, like, unless you're okay with dumping everything off from the camera the day off uh, you know at the end of the day right because you're gonna have to offload everything every day so think about it right instead of, so, so right now like let's say we're back when we were able to travel we, we go on location we do a shoot i you know if i have the time i will offload an entire card onto either my laptop or an external drive right and then i will still keep the card just in case something happens to either of those devices so that i don't lose any of my images but when you make it non-removable, where I have to physically purge all the data from it, that becomes an issue. So now, mm. what do I do? I have to bring two external drives with me? Like, that, it, it's, I, I feel like that's a problem. That's another problem that no, like, no one asked for a solution for. I think it's also really a problem because let's say there's a built-in hard drive and let's say somehow or another that corrupts. Oh, yeah, you're, you're you're up a creek. Yeah, you're screwed then. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I I had a card fail on me recently, and like that was that alone was annoying enough. 
but imagine so you're let's say you're on an extended trip right you know assume that we're allowed to do those again you're off on like a month-long trip across europe you've got your camera and then oh crap the internal nvme drive is corrupted and i can't write anything well, well guess what you either have to find some place where you can buy a new camera and send your old one back and you know have it arrive at you know repaired waiting for you when you return home and then you're now out what four thousand dollars to because you had to buy a new camera while you were on location like it doesn't make sense i wonder how it doesn't happen with the phone industry well the thing is a lot of the stuff there so most people don't have that much data on their phone a lot of you know if they do really I know people that like sit there and just hold the button down and take all the photos. Right, but then all that, those are the same people that pay 20 bucks a month so that they can just store all that crap on their icon and they never look at it. Some yeah. people do. Some people actually have to go through and delete stuff. Right. But, you know, if that does fail, then what do you do? Do you have to take the phone to either, you, you have to go to an Apple store or you go to a Samsung store, or Microsoft store, or whatever. And you have to get that replaced. And now you're you're sitting there, you're basically losing half a day. But think about like we don't have that for for DI, right? For digital imaging, we don't have that. We've, there's pro support with a lot of companies, but you still have to send it, like send your camera in. There's no real place where you can walk in and get same day service on your camera. You know, even if I like let's because like like for you and me, Chris, like we live in New York, like back again, pre-COVID, sure, we can just drop our camera off at Precision or somewhere, but it's still going to take, what, what, half a week? Mm -hmm. You know, you're, you're not going to be able to just walk in and walk out with a camera fix within two hours. It just, it's just not. That's why professionals a lot of times have multiple cameras, like, you know, have backups. But think about the amount, like, sure, you could store more data, like, oh, I can have up to two terabytes worth of images on you know, store within my camera. Sure. Like I, I, I'm sure that like, I can see special cases for it where let's say, you know, this is special designed to shoot underwater. Great. Everything is self-contained. Awesome. That makes sense. And then you can offload the stuff once you're done with the shoot. But for most people, it doesn't make sense. Just, or, you know, think about like wedding shooters, right? You have the primary shooter and then you have the secondary shooter. At the end of the night, usually what happens is the second shooter hands a card off to the primary and they're done. What, what I do now, I hand you my camera and wait for it, like wait for you to offload everything. Like, you know, so now I got to wait there for an hour and a half while everything offloads. Like, who wants to do that? Maybe it might mean that things like the Narbox become more prevalent. Well, that would require that wife like st you know every camera has built in wi-fi 6 yeah um and that's an that's another thing that's going that's going to severely drain your battery yeah t martin is saying in the chat that that's actually one of the reasons why he still has a few memory cards because uh yeah yeah i mean i every bag that i have i leave at least like three or four cards because i can swap them swap between them uh all my memory cards right here yeah, I have I have uh, I have a couple of these, a couple of these guys. Nice. Yep. Yeah, it's so like if anything else got destroyed, this thing is waterproof. So if my luggage gets dropped in the ocean, I know that my memory cards are still good. So yeah, and I have like I think four of those, one for each of the bag that I use. Uh, yeah, this is leather. If someone tries to steal it and thinks that it's an actual wallet, they'll probably just end up throwing away the cards, and I can find the cards. So there I'm you go. Pretty stupid. The cards are worth a lot more than. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. I, I Seriously. mean, what, like those those tough cards are like what 150 each. So like just this alone, this thing holds what like 14 cards. No, 12. So it holds like 24 cards, actually, because it also holds micro SDs. This is like more than a thousand bucks in here. Just memory cards. Actually, it's insane because the yeah. new CF, uh, CF Express cards. Oh, those are like two, three hundred bucks a pop. That's, yeah. Uh, dude, uh, 
what are they called? Uh, ProGrade Digital sent me fifteen hundred dollars in cards. I'm like, really, guys? Wow. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it, it's crazy. But um, I've, so kind of coming back. Uh, so yeah, they, they, these are like all the little things that are just annoying. Uh, but what 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 bothers you guys? <laughs> Brett, you want to go first? Anything yeah, on- sorry if you can hear my dog sparkling in the background. <laughs> it's totally fine. Don't worry about it. Um, <laughs> things that really annoy me, I think I've talked about some of them before, but what really annoys me is uh, I guess this is compound. I think that we need more rangefinder style cameras on the market, not too many SLR cameras. And But I think that's a compound problem with the fact that the camera in and of itself hasn't really changed designs over ever since the 35 millimeter camera came out. They're all like this box and they all have maybe a grip and there's a viewfinder on top or on the side. And I think that, you know, Sigma tried and failed really terribly. Um, But I think that uh, I see your faces. I see your faces right now. Um, I think that there there needs to be something else that changes. Like a lot of people, their first introduction to cameras are this. And oh, I think, yeah. yeah, I think that it might be cool for them to introduce maybe full frame point and shoots where you're basically doing this. And honestly, like it might sound a little insane. I hear my friend Brent just like basically vomiting in his mouth but sometimes it's actually very fun to go around and do street photography like this with a camera or like this with the camera so i think that the fundamental design of a camera needs to change and i think that starts with a giant touchscreen and then i think it goes inherently into weather sealing and more algorithms being shared amongst one another with the lenses and the sensors and the mounts and all that stuff. And then it goes into a fuller ecosystem. Like Sony had play memory apps. Oh my goodness. And you could add so many things to the camera. I still harp on that every time I, I see the engineers. Yeah, I know. But now you can't do things like they had their own version of live composite. They did. From Olympus. And it's gone now. I think you had to pay like five bucks for that or, but still like, okay, I'll pay the five bucks, whatever. Or, you know, touchless shutter. That was great. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So So I think that the overall philosophy of a camera needs to desperately change. And either we go very archaic and we charge a lot of money in the same way the watch world is, Mm -hmm. or they actually find like a way to jump light years ahead in technology. Um, yeah, I wouldn't mind a wastefinder style uh, camera where, you know, kind of like the RB or whatever, you like, you look down and there's a screen and then, because it changes the way that you shoot and you could like talk to your subject and it doesn't, you know, you don't constantly have a camera in front of your face, you know? So you Samsung can have had prototypes of that for medium format. Right. Um, that new Hasselblad was actually pretty cool. But you know, haven't tested it yet. It looks super vintagey. So, but, yeah, it's just yeah. I think all, all a lot of these like the apps you're saying. I think they sh- all all camera manufacturers should have some form of those built in. And you know, for like obviously this is completely pipe dream. But if every camera has film simulations and live comp and touchless shutter and you know uh, or uh, like the virtual NDs we've seen some cameras have, right? Mm-hmm. A virtual graduated ND would be really cool. Yeah. With in post. Mm-hmm. You know, one thing I'd really like to see, especially on, on so-called pro-grade cameras, is I'd like just love to see every camera have a top LCD screen. Yes. One of my biggest complaints about the R6 is there's no top panel LCD. And it means I have to drain battery either using my EVF to see what my settings are or to go through the touchscreen to see what they are. And yeah. that top panel LCD would be fantastic. Yeah, that's one of my favorite things. Um, even take it a step further, like on, on the GFX100, right? Oh, granted, it's a $10,000 camera, but you have the touchscreen and the back has a supplementary screen where all the settings are there. Yep. You know, like, you, like, you, like Chris said, like if you want to conserve batteries, okay, turn the screen off. 
But if I'm shooting like like at night, I'm shooting all exposures or shooting Astro, I don't have to keep the screen on, but I still see all my settings. How great is that? And I think they should incorporate those screens onto like a grip. Like mm -hmm. there's plenty of room here for you to put a small information on display. Like why not just add like sure there's gonna be cost to it, but you know what they all need then too? Illuminated buttons. Yes, oh, Panasonic's gosh, one yes. Of what I've done. That, that's mm -hmm. that. And I will commend them. Like, granted, their their bodies or it feels like you're holding a brick in your hand. But the, like, that's one of the few. I think Nikon has that as well. Some of the Nikon bodies, mm -hmm. the buttons are limited. And yeah, at night it's great. You know, you know, that was one of my biggest complaints about the RA. The one camera from Canon that's made to be used <laughs> yeah, in the yeah. dead of night, and it yeah. has no illuminated buttons. Yeah, guys. It's so it, stupid. <laughs> come on. Come on. Uh, that was such an afterthought. I mean, if they ever if, if they ever make like a R5A or something, maybe they'll mm -hmm. put that in. Yeah. It, it, it's just a lot of these things are like, it was designed by people that don't really use them in the field for what they're intended to be used for. Because you can see that there's certainly a lot of tech there, but mm -hmm. some of the thing like it's usually the mind like the smallest, most minute thing that they forget or they omit. I'm like, why on earth would you do that? If you actually use this camera for what it's intended for, like somebody's design decision just completely boggled the mind. You know, I was wondering that when Sigma was giving us the assets for the eighty five one four. Like they have they have like images of random things and flowers, but they had no portrait samples. And I'm just like, who's using what that? Stuff? What was that? Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and that's for, for something that's a classic portrait focal lens. It's like, hmm. Yeah. Brett, you want to close it up and uh, tell us what you really hate? I think you've covered almost all of them, man. I think touch screens have got to become the biggest thing they've got to start utilizing. This, this, just to see so much dead space, so much wasted space on touch screens that can't be utilized, it absolutely kills me inside. Um, personally, I would like everything to go fully touch screen to remove any other moving parts, to make the camera even more weather sealed, you know? Mm -hmm. um, that's a big thing. And this is gonna sound really stupid to you guys, I'm sure of it, but one of my biggest pet peeves is not having dedicated SD card slots. I hate when SD card slots are in next to the freaking batteries. <laughs> it absolutely drives me crazy. That annoys me. Yeah. 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 Why do I have to expose that part <laughs> to change a card? Yeah. That that's that's more of a that's more common on smaller bodies for sure. Mm -hmm. Like some of the absolutely. older bodies and the six thousand series from Sony. Uh, yeah, do you feel that way even on smaller cameras Brett uh, someone's asking in the comments yeah I mean SD cards aren't that big there's and you come across these cameras with absolutely nothing on one side of the camera there's no reason why they can't stick a, a card slot on one side of the camera there's, but, there's zero reason for it yeah I agree yeah yeah all right guys uh, any final thoughts before we wrap up uh, no, I think I think we've vented enough. <laughs> <laughs> I feel we could probably go on for forever, but yeah, no. Yeah. Um, everyone that paid attention and uh, tuned in, thank you so much, guys. We really appreciate you. Uh, thanks for the comments. Um, and tune in every Sunday. We will be back, no problems. Um, the end of this month is a holiday. We might take that off, but uh, yeah. Uh, 